Hi folks, it's good to be with you and love to everybody out there. Um, my website is jasonburnspreacher.com. You can get me on Facebook, you can get me on Twitter, and also you can look up uh, Royal Blood Ministries website, and there's a YouTube channel and Twitter there too. Uh, we don't make as many comments on there, but you know, from time to time, uh, if we get time, we will do. So it's good to be with you. Love to everybody. Um, I want to recommend some books. I've done a video recommending them. I'm going to recommend them again. Uh, Let the Nations Be Glad by John Piper, IVP. Let the Nations Be Glad by John Piper, IVP. Absolute brilliant book. Recommend it. Uh, Paul Barnett, Messiah, Jesus, uh, The Evidence for, of History by IVP. Paul Barnett, Messiah, Jesus, The Evidence of History, IVP. Excellent book on defending the historical Jesus. A real classic book which has got a lot of uh, information in is uh, More Evidence That Demands a Verdict by Josh McDowell. It's published by a variety of publishers and is an excellent work and would encourage you to get hold of that. It's a good apologetic book if you want to know whether your faith is true or not. And then an excellent book is by uh, Brian Edwards, uh, published by Evangelical Press, Nothing But the Truth. And this looks at the Bible and why the Bible is the Word of God. It's a, it's a, it's a very good resource for looking at why the Bible is the Word of God. I'd encourage you to get hold of that. That's by Brian Edwards, Evangelical Press, and uh, Nothing But the Truth. Really, really good book, so I encourage you to get hold of that. So, without further ado, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to look at the gospel-centered uh, life, the gospel-centered life from Philippians. So if you turn to Philippians, if you turn to the book of Philippians, and uh, we're going to be looking at the gospel-centered life, okay? So let's pray. <clears throat> Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you today and we acknowledge, O oh God, our need of you. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, these three are one. Father God, I thank you for your love and your mercies and your grace, for your infinite patience and your goodness to us. We ask that you might forgive us for our foolish ways. We ask that, Lord, you might bless us as we look at your word today. Seal it to our hearts, Father, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we're looking at the gospel-centered life. The gospel-centered life. And um, I want to talk about, first of all, keep focused on the gospel. Number one, keep focused on the gospel. Imagine um, a few ladies go out fishing. And there they are, they're fishing, and they have the fishing rods, and these ladies are just fishing. But they get distracted. They suddenly start getting their mirrors out, and doing their hair, and putting their lipstick on, and, and talking about boyfriends, and, and, and they're not focused on the fishing. They've got distracted. They've lost their attention. They've lost their focus. Paul never lost his focus. Paul was always focused on the gospel. If you turn to Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul and Timothy, the servants of Jesus Christ to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all make him request with joy for your fellowship in the gospel for the first day until now. Being confident of this very thing, that he which has begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Even as it meet for me to think of this of you all, because I have you in my heart inasmuch as both in my bonds and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are partakers of my grace. Paul was in prison. He could have been distracted with that. But he wasn't. 
He was focused on the gospel, on the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ and all that he has provided for us. He was focused on that. There are many, many distractions today in the church. Many want to use the church to entertain. Many want to use the church to be a social institution doing social work. Many in the church want to change the message of the gospel. They want to tweak with it, take the doctrine of hell out or try to make it more easy in the modern world. But if you turn to Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, Galatians chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle, not of man, neither by man, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead, and all the brethren which are with me unto the churches of Galatia, grace be unto you, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world, according to the will of God our Father, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another, but there be some that trouble you and would pervert the gospel of Christ. But though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel unto you that which we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul in Galatians chapter 1 verse 1 to 8 is saying, Look, you're te they're teaching a false gospel. Hold on to the true gospel. Again, he is focused on the gospel. There are many today that are very theologically minded, especially in America and in Holland. And you can become so intellectual, so theologically minded, that you lose the simplicity of the gospel. I believe in apologetics, and we use apologetics a lot in Royal Blood Ministries. We go down to London and we debate some of their apologists. And some of the guys that help me, we study apologetics and we use apologetics quite a lot. And it's important to use it, it's important to answer people's questions. But there's a danger if we miss the simplicity of the gospel. We should always come back to the simple gospel. We should always preach the simple gospel. So if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. One Corinthians chapter one verse eighteen. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, will bring to nothing the understanding of the prudent. Where is the wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the disputer of the world? Hath not God made foolishness the wisdom of this world? For after that in the wisdom of God. The world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. For the Jews require a sign, the Greeks seek after wisdom, but we preach Christ crucified unto Jews a stumbling block and unto the Greeks foolishness. The Lord, uh, Paul, preached Christ crucified. In the midst of your ministry, you will be attacked. You'll not get a lot of thanks from in your ministry. Your ministry will be tough, especially if you're a pastor or an elder. It, it will be a thankless task. It will be a difficult task. It will be a real, real battle. Sometimes in your ministry, you want to give up. But you need to remind yourself why you're in the ministry. You need to remind yourself why God called you as an elder, why God called you as a pastor. He called you to be a gospel minister, a gospel elder. 
You're there to proclaim the gospel. Not to be a social institution. Not to be a, 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 an institution of entertainment. You were there to proclaim that Jesus took the punishment and wrath for sinners and that if they repent, they can be saved. That's why you're there. And if you come back to the simple gospel all the time, you'll be strong in your ministry. And if you remember when you're in pain as a leader, when you've been criticized as a leader, when you want to give up as a leader, if you just remember this, that you are called to proclaim the gospel then you'll be strong again. You'll be focused again. That's why God put you there in the ministry to proclaim the gospel. So don't let your pain, the criticism that has come your way, the hurt, the desire to give up, move you away from that one focus that God has called you to proclaim the gospel. And so continue to proclaim it and don't give up. But we need to be gospel-centered churches. And churches need to be proclaiming the gospel. Churches, not just individuals, but the churches need to proclaim the gospel. We mustn't be sidetracked by anything else. Living a nice life and a middle-class life with a nice house, a nice car and nice children. That's not what it's all about. That's wonderful. And if God has blessed you with that, that is wonderful. And praise God for that. But you are meant for more in your family and in individual lives. You are meant to be part of a church. And that church should be a gospel-centered church proclaiming the gospel. That Christ died for sinners and sinners need to come to the Lord to find salvation. And you as a church must go out and proclaim that gospel. It's not good getting sidetracked by building. Should we have a big building, a small building? It's not good being sidetracked by money. Do we have money or not money? It's not good being sidetracked by politics or by entertainment or by anything else. No, you are a gospel-centered church and you should be proclaiming the gospel. There should be no debate about it. If you're debating about whether you should proclaim the gospel, you're not a gospel-centered church. A church should be gospel-centered. A leadership must be gospel-centered. A man and a woman with a family must be gospel-centered. You must be gospel-centered. We preach Christ crucified. That is our message. And too often... The church settles down into religiosity and into religion and everybody enjoys the middle class lifestyle and you become a church that has moved away from the gospel. Proclaim the gospel in your community. Proclaim it as a church, as a leadership, as a family. Because you are to be Gospel centered. If you was to read Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 to 18, you're to put on the whole armor of God. And what is the whole armor of God? The heart of it, then, if you read it, is the gospel. Too often we have made the church into a castle where we put up the walls of orthodoxy or we put up the walls of our religious culture and people, come in, pe people can come into our culture but we have these walls to protect our children, to protect ourselves. And we button down the door of the castle and we're in our little castle, enjoying our little lives of, of children and family and house and cars and, and work, which is wonderful. And praise God for that. Praise God that God has blessed you. Hallelujah. But we're in our little castle. And the walls are up and the doors are shut. That is an anathema to God. It is an anathema. And it is unbiblical. 
Jesus in his commission in Matthew 28 did not say put up a castle wall and put up the gates and keep it closed. He said go into all the world and make disciples and you and the church have turned it around and said no we will not go we will have a castle go and make a castle and hide away in your castle in your Christian culture in your nice little churches and hide away from the world and Jesus says no Go into all the world and make disciples. Be a gospel-centered church, a gospel-centered family. Focus on the gospel in your ministry. <clears throat> Secondly, fall in love with Christ. Fall in love with Christ. Imagine a boy... He's 16 and in the church he sees a picture of a beautiful girl. Uh, and this girl is on mission to in Israel. She's a missionary in Israel and he's never seen her before. But he sees a picture and he looks at the picture and he likes her, he loves her, he thinks he loves her, he thinks he likes her, but he's never met her. And then one day he meets her and she comes back from Israel to the church and he meets her and he falls in love with her and she falls in love with them. They're in a relationship and it's beautiful because he knows her now. He has a relationship with her. You can talk about Jesus. You can read books about Jesus. But it doesn't mean to say that you know Jesus. You can be in a church and brought up in your Christian family and as a young person you know the language, you can talk the language and you can hide away in that language and people think you're saved but you're not saved, you don't know Jesus. You talk about Jesus but you don't know him. You're able to kid your parents, you're able to kid your minister but you can't kid Jesus because you don't know him because you talk about him but you don't know him in your heart. Have you fallen in love with Jesus? That's my second point. Fall in love with Christ. Fall in love with Jesus Christ. Philippians chapter 1 verse 21. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Paul was in love with Jesus. Paul loved Jesus. For me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He loved Jesus. Jesus was everything to him. Jesus meant everything to him. He just was consumed with Jesus. If you read Philippians chapter 1, he mentions Jesus all the time. Verse 1, Paul and Timothy, the servant of Jesus. Verse 2, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus. Verse 6, day of Jesus Christ. Verse 8, Jesus Christ. He was filled with Jesus, verse 11, which are by Jesus Christ unto the glory. Verse 13, so that my bonds in Christ. Verse 15, some indeed preach Christ. Verse 16, the one preached Christ. Verse 18, what then notwithstanding every whether in pretense or in truth Christ. Verse 19, the spirit of Jesus Christ. He's full of Jesus. He loves Jesus. He can't stop thinking about Jesus. He can't stop mentioning about Jesus. He loves Jesus. Do you love Jesus? Have you met with him? Do you know him? Do you trust him? Are you in love with Jesus? Philippians chapter 3 verse 1 to 8. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord to write the same thing to you, to me indeed, is not grievous, but for you it was safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the circumcision, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might 
also have confidence in the flesh. If any other man thinketh that he hath wherein he might trust in the flesh, I am more circumcised on the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of the Benjamites, a Hebrew of Hebrews, as a man touching the law of Pharisee, as touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is the law blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Ye doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus, uh, the, the loss of all things, and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. You see, religion, he, he, he was not into religion, he was not into laws and regulation, he was not into pure orthodoxy. He was into Jesus Christ, knowing Christ, loving Christ. He was into believing in Him and knowing Him and loving Him. Are you into Jesus, my friend? Or are you so into your religion? You're so into your orthodoxy. You're so into laws and regulation. You've got to put a hat on if you're a woman in the meeting. Must do that. I want you to do that. But you forget it's needing Jesus. Loving Jesus first. You, 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 you got to be orthodox. You need to be orthodox. And, and unless you're orthodox, you, you're a second class Christian. I, I, but are you telling them no? You need Jesus. You need to know Jesus. It's all about Him. It's all about knowing Him. Trusting in Him. Believing in Him. Loving Him. Being delivered from your sin in Him. Are you in love with Jesus? Thirdly, being, we've loved it. Number one. Keep focused on the gospel. Number two, fall in love with Jesus Christ. And number three, be united in gospel work. Be united in gospel work. There can be no blessing in your ministry, in your church, unless there is unity in your church. Spurgeon often said when he went to preach in villages, if there was no unity amongst the believers in that area he could not achieve anything it quenched the spirit of god there has to be unity in gospel work and so often there are people building their empires their little ministry empires there can be eight churches in an area of the same doctrine of the same style of worship and they're not united they don't meet and encourage each other you can even have division within your local church where there are different camps within your local group of believe in church and it's no good it produces disunity and disunity brings a lack of blessing from God Philippians chapter 1 verse 27 only let your conversation be as it cometh the gospel of Christ that whether I come and see you or else be absent I may hear of your affairs that you stand fast in one spirit with one mind, striving together for the faith of the gospel. You to stand fast in one spirit and in one mind for the gospel. But so often God's people are disunited. So often there is disunity amongst God's people. People uh, uh, criticizing the leaders, people criticizing each other in different camps and different groups within the church and it's terrible it's terrible it brings dishonor to the, the the work of the Lord and and it destroys the work of the Lord and young believers cannot grow in such an environment they become unsettled and God cannot bless a work that's disunited so I'm gonna speak to some people now and you need to hear what I have to say Let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2 verse 1 to 14. And before we get into this, I want to say one thing. 
When I'm on about unity, I don't mean compromise truth. Some people say we must be united and ditch doctrine. That's just a lie. That's a pit from the devil. That's, that's a hellish belief. That's not of God. In Jude, it says, earnestly contend for the faith. We must stand for truth. Okay, so I'm not on about unity where we ditch the truth. Where we just say, we, we get rid of our truth and we'll unite with anybody and anybody. No. I'm on about those who believe the Lord. I'm on about Pentecostals. I'm on about Arminians and Calvinists. I'm on about people who really know Jesus. You really, and brethren and evangelicals and people who know the Bible and know the gospel and believe Jesus is God in the flesh. The Lord's people. And what about the Lord's people? Must be united. Must be united in proclaiming the gospel. Let's turn to Philippians chapter 2. I therefore, verse 1, I therefore, if there be any, therefore any consolation in Christ, if any comfort of love, if any fellowship of the Spirit, if any bowels of mercies, fulfill ye my joy, that you be like-minded, having the same love, being of one accord, of one mind. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon himself the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of man. And being found in a fashion as a man, he humbled himself, and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. Wherefore God also highly exalted him, and gave him the name which is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and under the earth that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, I you always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my presence. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. The reason why there is division within the church is because of pride. Some say I'm a Calvinist and they're proud of their Calvinism. That, that, that is a contradiction in terms. If you're proud of your Calvinism, you're contradicting yourself. If you're proud of your, that you're a Pentecostal, you're contradicting yourself. If you really, really know God, if you really, really know salvation, you will be humble. You'll be humble. And what tends to happen in churches where there is division... Pride comes in. Pride. And you're proud of your doctrinal position. And you force your doctrinal position or your practice upon people. You begin to have a self-will and you push and crush all your opposition because you're determined and proud of your position and you push it onto other people in the church. And it causes division and split and animosity and creates an unhealthy atmosphere within the church. My friend, you need to be humble. You need to be humble. Walk in humility before Christ. Walk in humility before Him. Know that He came and humbled Himself and died and, and, and became nothing for you and you are saved by grace and all that God has taught you, all the knowledge that God has given you, all the spiritual blessings that God has given you, you have to hold this with humility and with love. Not with pride. 
Not with arrogance. Not with self-will. Because you're like a bull in a china shop. Where you're in the church and the bull is kicking his legs and knocking all the, the things in, the, in, 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 in a china shop. He's knocking everything with his feet. And if you have pride, where you think you know everything, where you think you're right on everything, and you are going to make sure that everybody follows your way of thinking, you are going to cause division in that church. And you say, Jason, you, you don't understand. I am so sound. I am so right. They need to be sound, and they need to be right. Because I'm so sound, and I'm so right. Well, you sound so proud, my friend. He said, Jason, I don't like it, bro. Are you, are you, do you want to compromise sound theology? No. No. I believe in sound theology. But that theology must be walked with humility and with love. How long did it take you to grow in soundness of teaching? And you expect them to come to your level in a week, in a month, in a year? When it took you many years to come to the level that you came to? You need to give the church time to come to your level. You need to let God teach them to come to your level. You need to let God bring them up to your level. Not you, but the God. Not you, but the Bible. Not you, but the Holy Spirit. And what you're doing is, you are trying to get people to come to your level. You are forcing people to come to your level. And you need to pull back and say, wait a minute, I'm causing division. This isn't my church, this is God's church. I'm going to pray and let God speak to the elders. I'm going to pray and let God speak to the congregation. Let the word of God work. Let the Holy Spirit work. And you need to walk in humility. And that's it goes with the leadership. As leaders, you need to be humble. And every decision that you make, you need to bring it before the Lord. And it has to be the Lord's decision for that church. Not your decision, but allow God to be in charge of the church. And if you allow God to be in charge of the church, then you won't have division. Because if a leadership is following what God wants, then that leadership will walk in unity. And a congregation will walk in unity. It's when you have self-willed leaders and self-willed people in a congregation who are full of pride, you'll get division. Does that mean sometimes there comes a time when you have to deal with people? There comes a time when somebody comes into the fellowship who tries to produce, uh, tries to bring in false doctrine. That's a time when you have to stand up and say, no, we're not having that. Please leave us. Please stop what you're doing. We're not having that. Those are times when you have to do that. There are times when you have to resist false teaching. And that might cause division. But that's right division. That's biblical division. But don't cause division amongst God's people over things that are not that important. Or because people don't see things your way. Walk in humility. Talk in humility. Lead in humility. Teach in humility. Pastor in humility. Interact with brothers and sisters in humility. So when you meet someone who's Pentecostal, have humility. When you meet someone who's a Calvinist, 
have humility. And God will bless your ministry. So, be united in gospel work. Fourthly, lay your life down for the gospel. Lay your life down for the gospel. You turn to Philippians chapter 3, verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. So Paul is saying, I, I, I'm pressing on with Christ. I'm, I'm living for Christ. Christ is my everything. He was in prison. He was in prison and yet he was thinking about the churches. He was thinking about gospel work. He was thinking about how is the gospel pro being proclaimed in these days. I mean, what an amazing guy. Philippians 2.25. Philippians 2.25. And having this confidence, I know that I shall abide and continue with you all your furtherance and joy of faith. Sorry, Philippians 2.25. Yea, I propose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labour and fellow soldier, but your messengers and he, uh, but your messenger and, and he that ministered to my wants. For he longed after you all and was full of heaviness because ye had heard that he was had been sick. And Epaphroditus and Timothy were people who shared the gospel, who served the Lord with Paul, and they were unflinching in that service. John Rogers in the time of Bloody Mary, 1555 was burned for preaching the gospel. Nicholas Ridley, a bishop, was burned for preaching the gospel. Irenaeus, in Lyons, saw Christians murdered and killed. In the time of the early church fathers, bodies chopped up and thrown in the river, bodies chopped up and thrown to dogs. Did Irenaeus give up? No, he preached the gospel. Are you a man or are you a mouse? John Bunyan was locked up for 12 years for preaching the gospel. We need gospel lions today, people that will stand and proclaim Jesus and not back down. Are you a man or are you a mouse? Are you going to stand for Jesus or not? Lay your life down for the gospel. There's a story of a Mary Reese who was a missionary in Africa. Mary Reese, a missionary in Africa. A big gorilla came out of the forest. She said to the gorilla, get back in the forest. I've got work to do for my master, Jesus. She feared no man and she feared no gorilla. Are you a man or a mouse? Are you going to stand up for Jesus in your day or not? Proclaim the Lord in this day. And finally, enjoy your Christian life. Philippians chapter 2 verse 12 says, Wherefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. The context of that verse is people were selfish. 
People were arguing and not getting on. They were selfish and there was disunity. And Paul is writing to try and encourage unity. And the problem with the disunity was selfishness. People thinking of themselves. Paul is saying here, you need to be very, very serious about the way you live. You can't be uh, bringing the gospel into disrepute by being selfish and causing division in the church. And the, one of the things that will kill joy in your Christian life is selfishness. If your faith, your Christian faith is all about you, me, 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 my reputation, my, my, my advancement, my look at me, I want to be noticed in the church, I want repu respect in the church, I want uh, to be admired in the church, I want to do things in the church. If it's all about you, you're never going to have joy. The quickest way to joy is to forget about yourself. And think about the Lord. And if you turn to Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, it says, Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. That we, 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 we can have joy, even in the most difficult circumstances. Some of us are, some of you are broken in your spirit. You, you've got a broken heart, and understandably so. Maybe someone who you've loved has died in your family. Maybe a baby or maybe a husband or a wife and you're broken, you're totally crutched. So I don't want to minimise your sadness. But we can have joy even in the midst of pain. 1 Peter chapter 1 verse 8 and 9. One Peter chapter one verse eight and nine Whom having not seen you love, in whom though we now see him not, ye believing you what? Rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. These are people being persecuted. Romans fifteen thirteen. Romans fifteen thirteen. Now the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that you may abound in hope through the power of the Holy Ghost. You have hope today. If the Lord died and rose again and has saved you and the Holy Spirit lives in you and God has got you in his arm. It says in Romans 8 at the end, it says, nothing can separate us from the love of God. And Christ holds you in his arms right now and he loves you. And he saved you and the Holy Spirit's in you. And you can't see a way forward. It seems so dark to you. But you can rejoice. You can rejoice. Because you can say that Christ is with you. That you have a hope. Even the most difficult, hard situation, Christ is with you. He loves you. And you can have a peace and a joy. Even in the midst of your pain even in the midst of your grief because you have a hope a hope that will never fear a hope that will last for eternity isn't that wonderful so let's conclude the gospel centered life focus on the gospel keep your mind your ministry your life on the cross of christ Secondly, fall in love with Jesus. It's a, it's a relationship. It's not a religion, but a relationship. Are you in love with Jesus? Be united in gospel work. Stop backbiting and bickering in the church. Stop pushing your agenda all the time. Give the church to God and say, God, this is your church. Where do you want me in this church? What do you want me to say in this church? And only do things that God has told you to do. Only say what God has told you to say. And seek his will in the church. And to be unity in the church. Lay your life down for the gospel. 
We have a great heritage, great leaders that died for the faith. And so why are we cowering? Why are we holding back today? Let's be bold and proclaim that gospel like Paul did. And finally, enjoy the Christian life. As I've said to the Christians in Holland, take a chill pill. Chill out. Don't get uptight and in, uh, too intense. Take a chill pill. God has saved you. The Holy Spirit is in you. Yes, be serious, but just chill out. He's not going to abandon you. He's not going to leave you. The Holy Spirit's in you. He's working in your life. So enjoy it. You know the living God. You, God is your Father. You can pray to Him. You can walk with Him. You can serve Him. What an amazing thing that is. So just chill out. And know that God has it all in hand. And He's with you. Okay. Okay. So let's close in prayer. I hope that's been a blessing to you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you uh, for your goodness and love. And I just pray that all of us would be faithful to you. And I just pray that all of us would be remembered to be gospel-centered and to focus on you, Lord. Help us to maintain unity amongst your people. And help us, Lord, to be faithful and to, to serve you in humility, Lord. I thank you for this day. I thank you for your love and grace. And I pray, Lord, that what I've shared today in this message would be a blessing and encouragement and a help to your people. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 I hope that's been a blessing to you. And so God bless you.